Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought-provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. For the last six months, we have been delving deep into the world of municipal governance, conversing with individuals who sit behind the council table, the mayors, the reeves, the wardens, the councillors, and the directors who shape the future of their communities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Now, it's been an enlightening journey exploring their visions, their passions, and their challenges that their communities face. However, and this is a big however, for you and for myself as well, I must recognize and we must recognize that municipalities are not solely operated by those sitting behind the council table. Now, a robust and stable municipal administration is crucial for the effective functioning of local governments across Canada. And today we are embarking on a new chapter, focusing our attention on the dedicated individuals who work tirelessly behind the scenes, the municipal administrators. Now, over the course of the next few months, we will hopefully have the privilege of speaking with municipal administrators who are the unsung heroes, the frontline workers in the world of municipal governance. They are the ones who navigate the complexities of bureaucracy, manage the day-to-day -day operations of the government, and ensure that the wheels of local governments keep turning smoothly. Now, to kick off this insightful journey behind the council table, we are delighted to welcome a distinguished guest onto the show today. Joining us is Mr. Dwayne Nickel, the president of the Manitoba Municipal Administrators. Mr. Nichols has been serving as the president of the organization since 2022 and also holds the crucial position of CAO for the city of Selkirk, Manitoba. Now, in today's discussion, we will dive into the state of municipal administrators in the province of Manitoba, shedding the lights on the challenges that they currently face. We will explore how municipal administrations have adapted in the aftermath of the global pandemic, discussing the unique experiences and lessons learned from the extraordinary times. And additionally, we'll examine the crucial topic of transparency in the digital age, where information flows freely and accountability is more important than ever. Together with Mr. Nickel, we will strive to understand the municipal administration's role, the trials they encounter, their aspirations for the future of their municipal governance. So sit back, relax, and get ready to explore the hidden workings of Canada's municipal administrations in Manitoba. So, Dwayne, I want to start with the big question. I want to start the, with the question that sort of encompasses what this whole episode is all about. In your opinion, as president of the Manitoba Municipal Administrators Association, what is the state of administrations across Manitoba today? Yeah, that's um, 
Well, I'm going to be uh, completely honest with you, Chris. Uh, and I, right. I, I prefer that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to polish it. I, you know, I think uh, we're in a in a pretty rough state. Uh, to be honest with you, um, we have some of the challenges that we face are are uh, governance systems that are out of date. Um, uh, we have um, uh, administrators who uh, we have you know a transition in the generation of, of administrators coming. You know, new new folks coming in the last generation retiring and they're underprepared um for that and that's for a lot of reasons one of which is the fact that our administrative training in manitoba has not kept up with the changes in demand in local government uh we we've not kept that program up and so while it's still valuable training it doesn't it doesn't make you a a senior leader it doesn't train it doesn't train you to be a cao um and frankly we've chronically underpaid administrators in manitoba and we have uh, uh, historically underfunded or completely defunded training uh, for senior administration. So, so you take all those those things into account, and administration in Manitoba is is under resourced uh, um, and does not have the skills that it needs to to be completely successful in in uh, the the twenty first century. Like you know, for some of the challenges that we see in terms of the government uh, governance, you know, um, again, I. I have been an elected official, uh, you know, served for three terms, uh, and then on, now on the other side of the table as an administrator. Um, I, on one hand, I can count the number of times that I've met uh, somebody in municipal government. I've met hundreds of people in municipal government who I felt, yeah, they're they're not really here for the right reasons. They have a, an ulterior motive. They're not they're not really good for for their community. The vast vast majority of elected officials get elected with good intentions and want to do really good things. The problem is. We get them elected, and then we plunk them down into unhealthy, unsuccessful systems, and uh, then we expect them to be successful. And that's that's you know you can have good intentions, but when you when you walk into a council environment, how many new councilors challenge the agenda, the structure of the agenda, uh, challenge why there's the, the committees that they're on or that 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 they have, um, ask to see the policy manual and read through the whole thing and understand the systems that are in place. So. So we have these these governance systems that are reinforced by bad policies, procedures, practices, and cultures in in local organizations. And then we have provinces. Uh, uh, we have a province and 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 you know agencies within the province uh, that that reinforce those 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 bad processes. Put far too much emphasis on the mayor. Uh, put far too much emphasis on council um, uh, in terms of day to day organizational management. You have requirements for councils to pass resolutions on matters that are really are left best to the CAO. And always, it, I always find it interesting where when, you know, uh, organizations will bring in Cuff, George Cuff, and he'll talk about go good governance and, and all the rest of that um, and, and reinforce the, the one employee model. And so they'll leave the George Cuff, uh, you know, uh, seminar at the, the end of the couple of days and they'll come back to council. Or they'll leave early to rush back to get to their HR committee that they have at at the municipal office because you know uh, we're hiring some new staff. You know, like the the cognitive dissonance there uh, is 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 challenging. So, old governance, uh, outdated model, um, underfunding of chronic underfunding of administration, and devaluing of that position. And so, what that's left us with is us often having to go to the private sector to bring in uh, talent um, and, you know, they're coming in cold. They don't really necessarily understand. Yes, they've they've operated in corporations, but not municipal corporations in the unique structures and, and functions. So so we're not really doing a great job of trans of deepening the bench in, in Manitoba. And those who pe those people who do get into into these roles uh, are being um, they're being handed legacy systems that are not conducive to success in the current operating environment. It, since the last municipal elections, with last November, uh, October rather, uh, we we've had over thirty um, uh, CAO positions open up. Uh, uh, you know, ch change in staff. We have one hundred thirty-seven possible CAO positions in Manitoba. That's an astronomical number. And um, and how do you build when when the CAO when administration is supposed to be the sort of the legacy that transitions between council to council, how do you build any organizational structure or, or retain organizational memory? How do you build momentum within an organization with these frequent changes in, in administrative leadership? So yeah, not not a great situation, um, but uh, I think there's some really good folks at AMM, 
and at the MMA that acknowledge that, recognize that, you know, uh, we're working with the province i think there's some recognition there that we need to make changes and uh and so change is coming okay so i was not expecting that deep dive of uh answers to my very first question but i'm very <laughs> glad that you're being frank with me because i i'd rather be blunt and then we can have this this honest conversation that's what i like about these episodes is we get these honest conversations and i want to start with the big one and I want to start about the the out of date governance system that you've mentioned a few times in your opening statement. There, governance does not change at the drop of a hat. It takes time to change. What play? What are you putting in place? What is the Association of Manitoba Administrators putting in place right now, or the Manitoba Administrators Association putting in to ensure the longevity and the out of date system that we currently have? gets a makeover in some sense because you're not the only uh, organization that I've talked to who says that the out-of-date system of governance that we have is affecting the way that the administration is dealing with the day-to-day -day challenges that their municipality is facing. So I think there's two directions to work at this. Um, you know, I think fundamentally, we, uh, I'm a big believer in systems. I, you know, uh, in my role at, at, in Selkirk, um, I'm less interested in the projects and the one-off, uh, you know, exciting things that we get to do. I'm really, really, I geek out about the policies and processes that we're going to change because I'm more interested in the decision-making uh, process and changing that to improve by default the outcomes of those decisions uh, rather than by brute force making one good decision. I think it's way more valuable to change the system. So in terms of broad municipal governance, we go back to the Municipal Act and one step beyond that at the Constitution. So we are not an order of government. I'm sick and tired of having this conversation with people who believe that we are an order of government. Read the Constitution. We do not exist. Well, um, while you're not an order of government, you should be treated like an equal, should you not? Because I, I'm not trying to put, put words in your mouth here, but that's a big thing to say that we're not an order of government. You're right, you're not. But you should be treated like one because you collect the taxes that the federal and provincial governments take away and give you back a small portion of. <laughs> we, Good point. Uh, uh, and so building to that, I guess, really, uh, we, we have delegated crown authorities. Right. So the crown is, uh, you know, through the province of Manitoba, in our case, has delegated particular authorities and responsibilities to us. And so no different than a crown corporation, we have a sphere of jurisdiction, you know, things that we get to do um, and and authorities that derive from the constitutional powers of the province. So I think the first thing is for us just to acknowledge that. Let's let's talk about it, because I'm really sick of having provincial bureaucrats say, well, you're a mature order of government. This is a responsibility that you need to take on. And then not give us the, not have the respect or or delegate the authority to for us to have the resources to do the thing that they want us to do. So we are a municipal corporation, and in that statement, you know the the lack of creativity in coming up with another structure. We are a corporation, and so uh, you know we have this tension between orders and powers of government, um, and then delivering services as as if we were just a corporation, and that that'll get me to this conversation around. Uh, treating citizens like customers or consumers of of, of uh, government services. And that's a whole fundamental root cause of some of the problems that we have in, in Canada in, in governance. And well, beyond Canada, really. But that's a, that is a whole podcast conversation in and of itself. We um, might have to have you on for that other episode. Um, well, your ratings would go down. But in terms of in terms of uh, uh, just addressing the, the specific issue, so, so I think one when when we can acknowledge that the, it's all about the delegated authorities, I think we need to really work with the province to balance the delegated authorities with it, with the ability to raise revenues and and the powers to make decisions. And for the government, even if the province doesn't agree with those decisions, if it's within the jurisdiction of the municipality to accept and uphold those things. So in Manitoba, we have Bill Thirty Seven that has taken. Uh, uh, authority to make final municipal land use decisions out of the hands of municipal government. And at the same time, they're telling us that they're going to transfer this power to a, a group of appointees to make decisions about how land is used in our municipality. They're telling us that we're a mature order of government. Those things don't, you can't square that circle. And so we need to end that kind of thing. 
Um, now, the the role of the administrator, the role of the CAO, is uh, technically the only uh, employee that council has. Technically, that you are the only employee that the council has the right to fire or hire. That's it. End of sentence. No other staff. And I'm I'm going to ask a very political question here for you, Dwayne, and I think you're ready for it, but. You seem to be the political one in like you're willing to ruffle some feathers when it comes to bureaucracy, when it comes to dealing with the other levels of government, because mayors, Reeves, councillors have to play nice in the grand scheme of thing because they have to look nice when the MP or the MLA or the MPP comes to the town. So as your role as the city administrator and speaking in your role as president as well. Do you see your role in trying to advocate for better governance within the governance structure that you already have while trying to still be on that? And I, I hate to use this uh, analogy, but the leash that council has on you, because you, if you misstep, they can fire you. Yeah, well, so uh, there was a lot to that question, um, and I think... <laughs> It, it ties into, I said there was two ways to address the governance problem. And the first way was this broader, higher yeah. level, top down kind of approach. And uh, again, AMM, I think, is a good advocate for municipalities. They are the advocate when it comes to governance in Manitoba. MMA is the advocate when it comes to municipal administration and operations. So uh, certainly respecting the, the differences in role. But I think it's important for us to be honest about what the challenges from up top. From from the second direction, which I think speaks to your question, um, you know, I, I think it's important for administrators to speak truth to power. That is the value of, of administration. Um, I do not believe uh, that we should operate in the same way that a, uh, I don't think that we have the ability to operate in the same way, say a deputy minister would operate where, you know, you see the deference that's given to the minister and the decisions of the minister. Um, I think part of the CAA role in particular is both, is both, um, uh, both a senior administrator, so top bureaucrat in the municipality, but also kind of chief of staff to council. And and so part of what is ex expected out of us is because there is no political staff in most municipalities, certainly in you know Winnipeg and Brandon, maybe you have the ability to have political staff that provides political advice to to uh, the elected officials in every other municipality that does not exist in, Ma in Manitoba. So our role is sort of dual. We have to be, I think, to be a really good administrator, you have to understand the, the importance of politics and how, how, how um, and I, I, I'm different than a lot of administrators and in, in that politics is not a dirty word uh, in my mind. Politics is how we do things together. And it's, it's the art of say that to a politician and they'll say it's a dirty word, especially local politicians. They never want to be called a politician. Yeah. And that, and that, um, and that, and that's part of the challenge. We've trained citizens to think of politics as a bad thing or politicians as dirty. And, uh, uh we should own the role, a politician, uh, public service is a noble calling. And when you get elected, um, you know, I, 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 I chafe when some elected officials and um, uh, say, oh, don't call me mayor, just call me Bob, right? Or whatever their first name is. Uh, I've had that at, as an administrator. Uh, and my response is no counselor, I will call you counselors and last name. Um, because when you're in this office, when you're in the council chambers, you're not Bob, you represent more than you. And that's, and that by my, my using this language, it's a reminder to you. And it's a reminder to me that I have an obligation. You you represent more than your voice. And I can't treat you like a, just a, sing, a single individual. I have to treat you as a representative of the broader group. So politics isn't a dirty word. It's how we do things together. Um, I think there's uh, we need to be honest about the structure. But but I think um, the working from the second direction is challenging things. So you started the, converse, the, the, the question with the idea that, you know, CAOs are the only employee. Well, technically... Uh, or, or idealistically, that is the way it's supposed to work. There are very few municipalities in Manitoba that actually operate like that. While they have a CEO because the act requires them to have a CAO, they have HR committees, they have council members attend interviews for staff, they have uh, they have uh, public works directors respond uh, report directly to council and bypass the uh, CAO. They have fire chiefs that report directly to council and bypass the CAO. So we have structurally this problem. And, that, and that's what I'm speaking to. Uh, and so when you walk into council, this is the operate when you get newly elected, this is the operating environment. This is maybe how you ran because you saw that the authorities and no one questions or changes. Uh, no one has the presence of mind to say, why do we even do this? 
so when I first became CAO, I, you know, I saw those those challenges at council. I saw those those uh, inaccuracies in you know what we say and what we're actually doing. By changing the behavior, just by changing the policy, changing the agenda, I spent a lot of time at challenging my ma senior management team. They'd write reports. Well, this has got to go to council. Well, why? I have a signing authority. Why are we telling council? Why are we getting council to approve a thing that we know one it's in budget already? Two, I have the signing authority to sign up. Why are we sending it to council? That's not actually serving them. In fact, it invites them to focus on the, the tyranny of the immediate and the operations. And what we do is steal their time from focusing on, on the 50-year plan, the big vision, looking to the horizon, setting. That is not my job as CAO. I can help inform that. But but their job is to think of governance in the long term. What does this community look like in the next 100 years, not the next two months? And Is it hard? Is it hard to get people to think outside the box and not think that their role, because the role of a counselor is to direct the administration on what they need to do. Uh, I've spoken to some mayors and counselors who will literally jump in a grader and help out and do the job of a grader if there's staff. And these are small villages I'm talking about. These aren't the large like city of Winnipeg that I'm talking about or, or Selkirk. But there are some counselors who want to be in the nitty gritty of the day to day operation. Is it hard to get city councillors, mayors, Reeves to think their role is just to direct administration and not to be administration? Yeah, so a um, couple of things are one, I would say that the role isn't to direct administration. It's to, it's to establish a vision and, and, and set levels of service and say, this is what we want for our community. And their job is to hire the CEO who can create that. And if you can't, if you the CEO is not creating that through the delivery of municipal services, fire the CAO and get a new one because because you, you need to change right the you remember Chris you you clearly must remember from high school civics class that you took how, how what governance actually is yep well when I ask that question most people go what are you talking about there was no civics class and I have no idea what you're talking most people don't take governance training even at the university well, level. They, well, they don't I think even if they do, they don't understand the jurisdictional roles that the minister, the the, the right. levels of government also play, right? Because I've spoken to many municipal leaders across Canada, and they say, "Oh, this is a federal issue." I'm like, "No, it's a your issue." <laughs> well, it's funny because when you ask the citizen, they're all your issue, um, and, and that and that's part, and that's part of the challenge too, right? Obviously, as helping to educate the citizens, but because the citizens are our next counselors, that's the other thing. You know, we we kind of keep in mind in Selkirk is. The more we can educate the citizens, the more the next council will understand how this works, and and we'll have a we'll be able to to maintain the momentum. But but most people don't take governance, uh, not just municipal, but governance as a whole, like even board governance. They don't take that in school. They don't want to, even when I took political science uh, uh, in university, uh, like I left engineering to take political science, and that's a whole other story. But uh, but the, the there is no conversation about what governance is. There's jurisdiction there's powers there's history of you know politics but there isn't an un understanding what governance truly is so you have people who run for office who have great intentions they're typically type a type you know to use that old analogy those type a people they they are small business owners they're farmers you know the, uh, they're people who've led uh, community organizations so they're used to rolling up their sleeves getting in there and just getting the job done and and there's there's a lot of value to that but then they get into this structure that ought to be Getting the job done means you set policy, you set broad direction. You don't get into the greater and drive it, and that, and that's hard for people. It's it's a hard thing, and I'm you know blessed in Selkirk. I have I have a lot of people on council who have uh, had senior roles in 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 larger organizations, and so they understand the difference between policy setting and and the actual doing of the work. So you know it's kind of a unique situation for us, and I'm taking I'm taking it's it's. It's sunny out and I'm making hay now. And so the, the the role that I've been playing is changing the whole structure so that we reinforce that because there's a lot of those systems that reinforce the bad, you know, the bad practices of administrate, you know, inviting administration into the kitchen or pardon me, counsel into the kitchen of administration. So so changing those policies, procedures, changing what actually goes to counsel, um, you know, changing the bylaws that require council to approve things that really are more administrative in, in nature. So so laying the land so that the next council um, starts off on the right foot and we can maintain that that perspective uh, and maintain that work. And that's and really, I think that is to change um, one of the things as and that we're doing at MMA is one, we're we're fundamentally uh, changing the way we deliver training. 
and and developing a whole uh, competency model framework that will guide all our professional development and our certification program with the University of Manitoba that will fundamentally change what people learn uh, in, for our role and, and so stage it for, for the various levels of their career. Um, and then we want to start providing some of these tools and talk about how uh, administration supports good governance. And that's a big, providing all the information to council to make a decision isn't the right way to do the providing the, the uh, some analysis. Here's the background. Here's the information if you want to read it. But here's the analysis. Here's what we recommend. Um, so how so, do you, how, sorry, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you on that because no, I, I, I asked them, I, if you've listened to the show before, so you know the yeah. question I ask of mayors and councillors. How do you balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few? Because they'll get an agenda package with what administration is recommending. And then uh, council and, uh, will have to go out and ask their residents, hypothetically, go ask people because that's what they're traditionally supposed to do. Sometimes they don't. And they'll come in and they'll look at a recommendation from council and say, no, this is not the way that we want to go for it. We want to go in a different direction, whether it be an infrastructure project, whether it be roads, whether it be this, that or the other. How does administration and you as the role as the administrator of what uh, the policies that uh, council passes navigate the political side of the job when it comes to what council wants and what administration believes is right? It's so I think that you're the way you ended that question is exactly the issue that that has to be addressed. It's aligning those two things. OK, and so so. Um, I know that uh, a lot of my peers, peers of mine, I've heard say, "Oh, it was a political decision. They made this political decision." Well, so rather than being dismissive about it being a political decision, every decision a politician makes is rational. They're black box, right? You may not understand the criteria and the information they used to make that decision, right? But but they were rational when they made that, when they put their hand up or didn't. And so uh, I think part of our role as administrators is to one, help and understand better some of the decision-making processes that individual councils and council as a whole makes the dynamic of council and that. But it's also to uh, to take those black boxes and make them a little bit more transparent and and get alignment there. So uh, what we did in Selkirk in 2014 was establish our community strategic plan. And this plan set up broad vision, broad statements, a, a series of objectives. Every single, when I started a CAO, we changed the administrative report that we sent to council. And so we, uh, we, took, uh, we took the whole setup, changed it all around. The recommendation comes really early on, but before the recommendation comes, because it's not about a story, right? It's, it's about making a decision. So what is a process? And I sat as a council. I know that not all members of council have time to read every single report, especially when they're 50 pages or there's tons of background documents. So get to the decision and then justify your recommendation after. But every single one of our reports, the first thing you read is, how is this align or impact our strategic plan? What's that align? So if council passes the strategic plan, they set this broad vision, this is the direction we need to go. What we're trying to do is align our recommendations and, our, and the work that we're proposing to council with the strategic plan. Every one of our budget uh, budgets, um, so we prepare budget as administration, and we take that whole budget and, and present it to council. We say, here's our business plan first. Here's the things we want to do. Every one of those tactics, those work, those identified projects, initiatives for that year are aligned to a, a strategic plan item. And sometimes they're really strongly aligned, and sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're uh, uh, sometimes they're not aligned at all. But they're regulatory requirements. We have to change a process or do something. So council gets to see. How important is it for as as an administrator to remind council of those strategic plans and priorities? Because uh, sometimes they just go sit on a shelf after they're done, and I'm not trying to be rude there, but they do. <laughs> well, and that's um, so that's why every every council meeting we deal with a strategic plan because every report that they they see references a particular objective and one of the 26 objectives that are identified in our strategic plan and speak specifically to that thing. And so council may question whether whether uh, our interpretation of that, of that strategic priority is, is in alignment with their vision of it or not. But, but you know, we are making an honest attempt at, at aligning the work that we do. And that, that's how you get success in any organization is about focus, right? It's about not trying to be all things to all people. It's about doing the things you said you were gonna do and doing them very well. So. Um, and we've had some consistent consistency at the council table, so that's very helpful. Um, 
But I think starting with a strategic plan and and getting agreement at that broad vision. And and one of the things I tell people, because there's lots of communities with strategic plans, uh, but they do it every after the election. The first thing they do, they go into strategic planning. They call it strategic planning. And, and the plan is a four-year plan. Well, that's not a strategic plan. That's a re-election plan. And that's <laughs> different, right? Uh, you can have commitments and promises that you've made to, to the citizens and you want to get done. But does do, do those pro, those those commitments and promises in the and the four year election reelection plan does that really align with the long term uh, create a long term vision for the community? So you know our plans uh, are at least five uh, five years long, so they outlive any one council. Uh, they extend to the next term. Yes, council has the right at any time to change their strategic plan, and if you've got a complete mandate change at council, maybe it's a, a uh, the right thing to do because the citizens have said no, we don't want to go in that direction any longer. We want to go somewhere else, and that's fine. But but for the most part, you have to think about those. You have to extend the the time horizon, and we have to create systems that encourage councils to see beyond the time horizon. Thinking about the twenty and fifty year stuff. There's lots of projects and initiatives that we I, in Selkirk we bring to council saying this will not help you get reelected. In fact, this will be rough for you over the next couple of years. But in twenty years, the council today is going to thank you. They're going to want to name streets after you because we've set them up for success. I want to turn to the role of the administrator for a second, because I have covered municipal government uh, politics in Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and a partial time in BC. And I have seen the attacks on the, the elected officials pretty prominently over the last 10, 15 years. And I would say in the last five years, and specifically during the global pandemic, we saw a rise in administration attacks from residents. Uh, whether that be the CAO, the director of operations, the greater driver, the line painter, this, that, or the other, the rise of the hatred that I've seen on social media or even through uh, just being on the ground in a small town in northern Alberta when I worked there. How do you see your role and how does the administrators of Manitoba see their roles in fostering a positive workspace, but understanding that politics is this, governance is this, governance is people being able, especially in the digital age, to say whatever the heck they want to say about you and not face any consequences because it leads to burnout from staff. It leads to vacancies. It leads to service cuts. It leads to 30 CAOs in Manitoba, as you openly said, not being in the position here soon. How do you see your role and how does the MMA see their role in trying to change the atmosphere in the province when it comes to the attacks that the administration is seeing? Yeah, I mean that's uh it's true I think for local government and it's true for you know other levels of government as well. There there is a new disrespect for for government period. Uh a, a new level of it that I think uh, and this is it's not new though, right? It's been in my opinion it's been building and that was kind of my reference before about the transactional nature that we've encouraged citizens to see government as uh, so, you know, uh, we have the rise of neoconservatism and Frederick Hayek and and Reagan, you know, Reagan's government is the problem statement uh, in the 80s. And that that has built and and that's been this momentum. And you see this primarily in American discourse, but it, it's certainly bleeding into 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 government here in Canada, uh, where government's the problem. And, and we've othered government, right? Citizens uh, see themselves as customers. They see the taxes that they pay as the price of admission and, and services. And if they pay more, they should get better or more. Um, and so we've we've made the relationship with, with government transactional rather than reinforcing the idea that as a citizen, you are an owner of this. We pick up garbage. That is a service that is provided. It's not provided to you. You're providing it to yourself. It's just more efficient for us to, to get someone else to come in and do it for, rather than all have all of you take the garbage to the dump. That that we've decided together that that is a service that we want to provide. And, and so we don't educate, we don't encourage people to think of the responsibility side of citizenry, right? Um, that they have an obligation to, uh, if there's something going on that's wrong, to share that, uh, to pay attention to the decisions that are being made and share their opinions. Um, you know, people talk about increasing transparency and accountability in local government. That's 
ridiculous. It's the most transparent and accountable level of government. And I'll use that term level of government that there is, right? You know, the names of the people half the time on the grader. And like, there is no transparency or accountability issue. Every four years you get to, the problem is people aren't paying attention. And, and so all the information is available, you know, all the systems that we have to jump, the hoops that we have to jump through with the province for reporting and structures and all, it's all there. You get to see it all. Some people have even gone into performative uh, accountability and transparency by by broadcasting on the internet uh, their their council meetings, which is a whole problem in and of itself. But uh, the why do you think that? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not trying to distract you. Just okay. I think it's fascinating. I I love it because I get to see the councilors at work because hypothetically the House of Commons, the legislative assemblies are broadcast. So another level of government. It just seems so. Yeah, I, the the problem with it is the same problem that has happened in the House of Commons and primarily and also in provincial legislation is not performative. So you don't have actual exchange of debates. People are afraid to look stupid by asking uh, uh, important questions. And so it, you, you, you you haven't watched a lot of council meetings that I'm assuming because I've watched a few over the last few months. Yeah, I, I I remember when, you know, the conversation at in university when the House of Commons, when they started broadcasting the House of Commons and the behavioral changes that you saw and the degradation of question period. And I mean, it was never great, but but, you know, it's no longer a place for for good philosophical visionary conversation. It's a place to uh, try to garner some eight second media bites, some bites and to get some more votes. And that's that's. I mean, it's problematic, right? We have to create those places where counts, where elected officials can can be foolish. They they can they can ask the, the the tough question. They can they can change their opinion. Heaven forbid they learn new they get new information and they have they get to change their opinion and not be called flip floppers. Like this is we should encourage good debate and we should encourage good debate outside of the council chamber as well within the citizenry. And so I think the issue is that we think. Uh, count, citizens don't think of, of municipal government until something's not working or doesn't work the way they want it to. And then they raise their concern in a way that they would raise, bring back a Big Mac because it has uh, uh, pickles when they ask for no pickles. You know, that that's that that's a challenge in our system. I don't blame citizens. I don't blame elected. I, we, we have all worked towards this thing. You know, uh, at the administrative side is is we have what we, you know, new public management. Uh, you know, was the the big the big idea uh, uh, re reinventing government? Uh, you know, Gabler and, and you know this was all about uh, how do we you know use business practices to uh, provide better government? And so we have a whole generation of bureaucrats calling citizens customers or consumers of our service. Well, if that's how we treat them, that's how people are going to respond. So we need to encourage more ownership over local government decisions, more ownership over the direction of, of their, their community and more, and that requires more attention that gets paid. And so that, that is a larger sociological conversation that we have to have. And, and, you know, um, it, it's at the administrative level. I think that's part of it is, is creating good systems of governments and reinforcing good governance. Um, and sometimes that's going to mean CAOs get fired because they refuse to, to uh, work in environments where they're not treated as, professional administrators i want to turn back to transparency for a second because i i've worked in administration i i know that transparency is key for a lot of council members especially when they're first elected there's usually that mandate of we're going to be open we're going to let you know when the, where the greater is what street it's going to be at eight o'clock in the morning and how everything runs but as you openly just said and i think it's the best thing i've ever heard uh, in one of these interviews in a long time the information's there. The information's there. But as someone in the communications field who's worked in communications in a municipality, you can communicate till you're blue in the face. You can be as transparent until you're blue in the face. But unless you go knock on every single person's door in the community and go literally hand it to them and read it to them while they're standing in front of you, there's always going to be some people who say they just didn't know. They just didn't know. They didn't understand. So how does your role as administration and as administrator of uh, the policies that that council directs change the way that transparency works in your office because if we're already doing it how can you do something more if you're already doing it to the best of your ability unless you literally go and knock on everyone's door so great question and and uh, uh full disclosure prior to working at the uh, um at the city of Selkirk, my my daytime job was uh, manager of marketing and communications for Assiniboine Credit Union, one of the largest credit unions in Canada. Um, the 
the issue that we have is we have busy people that have lots of things that are going on, a lot of distraction. We, we you know, we talked about the distracted society. Um, they're not paying attention. And so you can't teach anyone anything if they don't care, if they're not paying attention. So uh, putting out endless uh, media uh, web stories or, or not web stories, but like uh, social Facebook media posts, posts or, Twitters. Yeah. Yeah. About the right way to do, you know, raise a, to do a thing isn't effective. What you have to do is catch them when they're interested. So in, I can't speak to other municipalities really, but one thing I'll say is that there's a lot more recognition that communication is important. We have to see a lot more marketing communication coordinators in municipal government more than we've ever had before. And that's a good thing. Um, uh, Cause we, we need to craft a better message and time it better. So in the city of Selkirk, we have done some, some, what I think are kind of innovative things. We, we focus on just in time communication. So, uh, rather, uh, you know, we have this situation where we 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 uh, we made some revolutionary changes to our downtown. We we changed direction of a street, or like you know, it was one way. We made it two way. We changed the parking. All of this stuff was communicated in a strategy document that was written six years prior. So it's all laid out. This is what we're going to do. We just couldn't do it at the moment, and we put it out there. And we engaged citizens. We had people come to public, you know, open houses. We talked about it, and it got documented. And then we went and did it. And there is a cluster of folks who's, how dare you do this thing? You didn't even consult us or tell us or we did. It was sick, but you, for one, you weren't paying attention at the time. And two, even if you were, you probably forgot that you participated or this was the public conversation. We showed them the document. We showed them the, the news articles that appeared in the local paper. Didn't matter. You didn't consult us. You didn't. So the issue for us is, is timing communication for when people care. So when we do work on a street, as an example, um, we uh, we send a we knock on every door or put in a flyer in everyone's everyone's door that that, that you know a week in advance before the, your streets ripped up or we were digging up your the pipe in the front of your house we 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 let you know what the project is here's what you can expect here's the noise here's the thing all the things that are going to happen here and then the majority of the communication piece is about our capital asset management program this is the value of our assets. This is the things that we do. This is why capital asset management is important. This is why some of the decisions uh, we make around about timing of projects. And 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 so we, we try to ed educate at that moment. We have a whole street tree policy in, in, coming out of our climate change adaptation strategy. And we're putting in trees. And every every street in Selkirk will have tree, street trees. And that's not the case today. But in the long run, that's going to happen. So whenever we plant trees, we have this big sign right beside the sidewalk. And it talks about the value of trees, and it, it's it's a like an infographic. We talk about the the economic and social and environmental return of having street trees, and, and so you've we've changed their environment. We've put this tree in front of their house, and when they're walking down the sidewalk, there's a sign, and they can read about why we're doing the thing that we're doing. And so we have the policy. The policy's been approved. There's lots of news stories about it, but most people weren't paying attention at the time. We're educating them at the moment that the, their interest has peaked, and hopefully they retain some of that information. Road signs. Um, when we do road work, we put up a big sign that says, you know, new investment into, into the municipality. We tell them what they're doing and then we tell them how much it's going to cost. You'd be amazed at how many people go, I can't believe how much road work costs. Yeah, that's why taxes are the way they are. So it's 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 this a way of of shoehorning information in when people are interested and they're willing to accept it. And that's and that's that's really the key to, to helping educate citizens and, and 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 knowing that communication is not about a one time message. It's about repeatedly saying the same thing over and over and over again in different in different mediums and in different ways and timing it so that you're getting to them when they're really interested. So that's that's kind of what we've been focusing on in terms of into in terms of our public education, public communication. Do you see an apathy, apathetic nature in the, the in the province of Manitoba? I've asked many mayors and raised that question, but from the administration standpoint, is there an apathetic nature when you go out and you try to get input? Because council will say, do a survey or have a, a report and ask residents or go talk to people on the street, see if it's uh, if it's needed. Is there an apathetic nature in Manitoba where people are willing to give their feedback to administration, or are they wanting to talk to? counselors instead you know I, I i struggle sometimes with the term apathetic and not because it's an inaccurate term but because there's a connotation that's that has been attributed to apathetic right apathy in that um it you know people are intentionally not interested in having a conversation i think they're distracted and i think they're focused on all bigger things um in in terms of their own personal lives right they, they've got a lot of other decisions and they've delegated to us the decision the decisions around operating the municipality and because they've done that, because 
uh, they've been trained that government is transactional. The only want to communicate when there's a problem. And so it's harder to get people to say positive things. It's harder to get people to say you're doing the right thing uh, or we like it. Um, people like to be asked what their opinion is, and they'll give you your opinion when you when you ask it. The issue for us is, is that information valuable? And how, you know, we use public surveys. We have a whole um, a citizen voice panel that we use in, in Selkirk. The question, the issue is never ask a citizen a question that they're not experts in. So don't ask a citizen how the street should be engineered or constructed. They're not engineers, most of them. Um, ask them what services, what do they want to get out of the street? What is, what is, you know, how do they currently use the street? Those are things that they're experts in. So asking them how they use it, how they'd like to use it, what are the, and then interpreting that information and then translating that into, well, how do we deliver on that expectation, that reasonable expectation of our citizens? And that's that balancing act between, you know, the needs or wants, typically it's the wants of one versus the broader need of the, the, the bigger community. It's having that strategic plan and knowing what the, the, what the objectives are for everybody, what, what we're trying to all, you know, the, the, the direction we're all trying to row in and then evaluating those specific projects or initiatives against that broader, does it bring us closer? Or does it make it harder for us to achieve that? And that's, that helps council make those decisions. We have a situation in Selkirk right now where council is being asked to make a really challenging political decision around rezoning. It, we, we need housing. Every municipality in Canada is talking about housing. We need more housing. We need more market housing. We need more affordable housing. But you know, the big issue, issue for us is not, uh, it, it's, it's supply. There's just a lack of supply and we have more demand uh, then we can, so they have to rezone. This is excellent project in our downtown, bringing people all the things that you hear as best practices in land use planning and council's been taking the training and, and understand it. They want to make this decision the right way, but there's this citizen pushback and it's, it's people who live and are going to be directly related to that. So it's about providing council with really good information and reminding them that what the broader community expects out of them, they told you they want housing. So yes, you're getting a little bit of pushback from these local folks, but it's still from a land use planning perspective, from from a, a community building perspective, it's all the right things, and it's what the rest of the citizens want and expected of you. So you have you, you know you have a choice, but but recognize that the the needs or the wants of these these you know uh, 40, 50 people that are in the in the council chambers do not represent the ten thousand five hundred and four people at home who are expecting you to do the right thing. I just realized we're at the 40 minute mark and I told you 45 minutes. Do you have an extra 10 minutes for last round of questions here? I'm on vacation, Chris. You can have all the time you want. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I want to talk about the last area that we literally, we haven't even gotten to the second part of my <laughs> statement, but I wanted to go to the, uh, the one last thing that you talked about in your opening statement. And it's about underpaid and underfunded. Mm -hmm. And, a lot of municipalities are being asked to do more with less money. And that means that administration is being asked to do more with even less money because they have to be divided. Div uh, the money has to be divided up into five, six, seven departments. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that staff is being underpaid. And that is a big thing to say, because a lot of people, a lot of politicians, a lot of local councillors will say, we don't want to raise uh, uh, salaries for anyone because they're already greatly, they're already paid well off. Uh, we need to look at service levels. We need to look at infrastructure. How do you get people to change their mind about investing in the people that run our cities and not make it a negative stereotype that we're just paying another director or another manager or the lifeguard a little bit extra money to make sure that our city runs smoothly? Uh, fundamental question for us as CEOs to sort of uh, to deal with that that particular issue. Uh, the biggest problem is has nothing to do with the money. It has everything to do with a not a, a lack of a understanding for what we're trying to achieve together. So without that strategic plan, without key performance indicators, without articulated levels of service, without a, a key sense of what we're trying to deliver, um, everything seems expensive, right? You you if you have money in the bank but you have no budget, you have no plan for that. You're pretty sensitive about spending any of the money because you don't know whether you're going to need it or not. Uh, you know, like, is this the right, is this the right, the right call? And it's made more complicated by the fact that you have 
seven or nine or whatever number of people all having different value systems and and looking at it from their own perspective because you don't you haven't created a unified um decision making sort of framework for for them to like a an objective so for us it's about clearly identifying what the want or need is communication was an important thing we wanted to really communicate and council invested in hiring first one person and now we have a whole citizen engagement team that does kind of like a 311 you know service uh, service uh, response team that's integrated into our communications uh, uh, program uh, so we have we call it citizen engagement um uh so they were invested and you invest over time but you have to give feedback you have to show how it's working so here's the problem here's the solution here's how we're going to know whether the solution is meeting is is it achieving so we have a, a dashboard system for council to take a look at at uh um, you know, how, how we're achieving those objectives, how we're responding to citizens. Uh, we're working on a communications uh, a report so they can see the value, you know, the actual dollar value of having, you know, earned media uh, coverage and all that kind of. So it's about it's about um, shining light on the, 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 the success or the delivery of that. When I reference the under chronic underfunding of administration, there is for sure that there is the we, we don't invest in the, the number of people in this particular skill sets. That I think you can you can address by by the things that I just said. The bigger challenge, I th or not the bigger challenge, but the the challenge that we face most immediately right now is that uh, we undervalue as a system the CAO, and we refuse to pay the CAO what they could get in in private industry. So we're trying to hire people from private industry. But if you want an, a, an executive level decision maker, somebody can do these, these, the, the, you need to be paying way more than the average CAO is getting right now. And so what we've done is work with M, uh, uh, AMM. So MMA uh, led the work, but, but brought AMM in because they're the employees, they represent the employers in this situation and created a salary matrix. So we took a look at, uh, you know, the what are the sort of factors you have to consider? So the complexity of the municipality, the skill set of the individual, all of those things and capacity to pay. That's another consideration that we have to give, um, and then and then looked at the, the full evaluation of what people are being paid in Manitoba for the role, but also looked at other sectors. So where are we finding people? So in the in the municipal or the provincial sector, what's the comparable roles and what are they getting paid? So making sure that it, you know outside of the sector uh, there is some com uh, competitive or uh, comparability, and we're we're offering competitive salary, and then a system for keeping that current. And so we've established the CAO salary matrix and a tool to help people guide them through the the, the tool. So when they're recruiting CAOs, they can properly price the value of the work that they're doing. Because we're not, you know, we don't have a union to advocate on behalf of. Uh, we don't have a union agreement, right? So that that's kind of the challenge. But if you want high quality, high talent, uh, high talent individuals, you're going to have to pay for it, and that's it's getting harder and harder to attract those folks. The other solution is is growing your own. So investing in the training and development for for administrators underneath the CAO to take the training uh, to to grow their capacity, so that you can you know in a smaller community that where you're having a hard time attracting someone to move to your community to be CAO, you're finding local people, training them up, skilling them up, and then and then giving them an opportunity to lead the municipality, and they're going to be. This is my bias here. Because I live in Selkirk, I was born here. I, you know, I, I, I hope to die here uh, in the long run. Uh, the uh, uh, having somebody who lives and knows the community as and service CEO creates a level of trust with the citizens that that bring someone else in who's never lived there, doesn't know uh, the community, uh, creates that. So I think in the long run, that's a better solution. But we're going to have to prioritize. Training dollars are always the first thing to get cut uh, get cut in 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 uh, difficult times. We have to reverse that because the world is not getting simpler. It's getting more complex and and the skill sets are getting uh, deeper and and more um, uh, specialized. So we need to be investing in training. And that's that's not there today. But I think, you know, we need to keep pushing uh, uh, um, to get there. I'm going to ask a very poignant question right now, and I apologize for this. But how do you make the role of CAO sexy? How do you make it so someone wants to go into that position? Because I don't see a lot of people going out of high school, or university saying, you know what? I want to be the CAO of a community uh, of X, Y, or Z. They want to be the politicians. There's a lot of type A personalities. They don't want to be behind the desk. They want to be in front of the desk. And even on top of that, the people who are in administration, I've worked with them. I know what they say. 
I don't want to have to deal with the political ramifications of what council wants and needs and the day-to-day ongoings of what council is going through. I'm happy just being a director. And if someone ever came and tapped me on the shoulder and say, would you like to be CAO? Their first answer would always be hell no. And I'm not trying to be rude there. So Mm -hmm. how do you make the role of the CAO, the city administrator, something that people strive to want to be? Because if you don't have that desire and that sort of glossy picture of what a CAO is, then no one's going to want to do it. Right. Um, so that is that is one of the issues that we struggle with in, in Manitoba, for sure. Is it, I think it first starts off with how many people coming out of high school know that there is a CAO? <laughs> sure. Like, there, it's, it's a, a faceless bureaucrat behind you know, behind the services, they don't, you know, a lot of them don't even know who their elected officials are per per se. So they don't, again, we're not, we're not reinforcing that message. Um, But uh, I went to, in my undergraduate degree, uh, we almost never talked about municipal government because it's not an order of government, right? We talked, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a topic we focused on provincial. And so a lot of my classmates, their, their end goal was either, you know, political side or working in munis- in uh, provincial federal administration they were looking at the, the the bureaucracies they weren't thinking about being in the local government so one we have to we have to get on the radar screen in in, in uh, the training programs and educate you know even in, in community colleges so when you I mean take business management well there needs to be you know uh, public sector management um, and 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 municipalities need to be part of that conversation so when people have to be aware of it um, and then we need to create governance systems where the CAO can actually be an executive level leader, be a strategic thinker, and be able to offer that kind of advice and have that kind of influence in terms of the operation. Um, I often, again, I, I was elected and, I, and now a CAO. I often, when people say, well, you know, wh- uh, what's the difference? What, what do you like more? I always say that council was way more fun, but I'm getting way more done now as a CAO. I have way more influence over the direction of our of our community. I have way more ability to use my skill set and my my training and ed- education to better the community. I can have way more impact as, as CAO because I'm there day to day and I can help guide and I can in, I can uh, help educate council and and provide them with the right information to make really good decisions. I have way more influence. My fingerprints will be on this community for a long time after I'm gone. And, but are you okay with not taking the glory? Because I think that's what the, the big thing that I was trying to get at. Because yeah, your right. name is not never going to be on the plaque. It's going to be the mayors. It's going to be the councillors. Or it's going to be the MPs or MLAs. City administration, they'll come and go. They, they, they People might know who they are. But they never get the recognition that the, the mayors and councillors do. And the role of CAO can sometimes be daunting. Because while you get a lot done... There's a lot on your shoulders every day. And I always ask the weight of the responsibility of being an elected official to a mayor, but the weight must get to you as well, because the decisions and the directions that you have to uh, work with in administration probably weighs on you when you go to sleep every night, doesn't it? Yeah, there's there's a more than enough sleepless nights <laughs> or waking up at three o'clock in the morning and second guessing or wondering why, you know, uh, um, I used to walk really early in the morning around and uh, my staff would walk in, come into the office in the morning with with four or five different emails that sent at four o'clock in the morning from me because I saw something or I thought of something. Uh, sure. Yeah, there is a lot of stress. There's a lot of. But I think any job uh, where you have a lot of authority and responsibility comes with stress. The stress is a, is a recognition of that and not having this job and not feeling the stress just means you're doing it wrong because you're probably not putting enough you don't realize the importance and 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 the, the fragility of things uh, if you if you don't feel that stress is how you manage that stress and and balance that off with celebrating the small successes and the, and the small wins i i'm a little different than than some of the other uh administrators in manitoba one of the things we baked into bylaw is our uh, communication public communications bylaw and and so i am the spokesperson for the municipal corporation of the city of selkirk the mayor is a spokesperson for council uh, and I, so I get quoted a lot more. Uh, and so recognition is not a thing that I seek, but I often get attributed to some of the things and work that we do because just because of the structure that we've created. Uh, there are a lot of people who who um, live by the idea that uh, you can do some amazing things if you don't care who gets credit. And I think um, uh, for me, the the what I'd like to see is just a better community, a stronger community, and knowing that I played a role in that, 
and and having that having that as part of my um my life experience right my my legacy as a as a human being is is just leaving things better than i found it um i mean that's where i and not everyone not everyone seeks that kind of role some people are all all uh, more interested in recognition than than doing the work and that's fine but they're not probably right for that role there's you know uh, i think even more uh uh in provincial and federal jurisdictions uh you've got senior bureaucrats you know deputy ministers and stuff that are in, in the exact same situation right but but even more so because of the the structure you know they, they're not necessarily the folks that get remembered for policies but they, you know they wrote it or they suggested it or they informed it um but they want to do good work so there's nothing in this world is done by the will of a single individual everything is done um uh either by a result of a team or or a cascading series of events right emerging phenomena where lots of little things have happened that allowed the the one big idea or the one big thing to happen so so we have recognition systems that sort of uh give the award to the the, per, the last person on that rung of that ladder but it took a lot of other folks to, to get there i think that's true for business as well you see uh Bill Gates did not code everything in Microsoft, but he was the name in the face. There's lots of people that did great work behind it and, and are happy to do that. Not everyone is, is suited for the CEO role. That, that's true. Not everyone can make that, that um, make the decision. Can you tell a good CAO? Can you, as for someone who's been in the position on both sides of the table as CEO and as counselor, can you tell when someone would make a good CAO? And on the flip side of that, can you tell if someone's going into the position in an incorrect way, like someone who should not be CAO and you don't have to give names. I just, I, I want to know, it, <laughs> no, I'll, is, the, I'll, is there a trait? Yeah. Is there a trait that you look at when you say that's a good CAO? That's what, that's what more CAOs need to be. And then others go, how the hell did you get that position? <laughs> uh, yes, there, there are. Um, I, I think the first thing is, is to recognize that, that there, there's a, there's a scale of CAO. Uh, like a, a paradigm and it it depends on what kind of council environment you're going into i am not a good cao for lots of municipalities the vast majority of mental municipalities would not want me um because i won't stand i i just won't i won't work in an environment where council is telling me to fix that bottle and then fix this bottle and and a council member uh you know feels they can walk into the operations department and 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 start directing that would not fly with me i would get my arse canned immediately in lots of municipalities because i would one fire the staff person who listened to the, the council member and two i'd pull the council member aside and say don't you ever do that again and i'm not i don't i don't report to you i report to council as a body that doesn't fly in lots of places um so i think you have to acknowledge that there's a, a range and that's about the what who is going to fit in that particular governance environment and, and be successful um but i think if you there are traits for communities that want to be progressive grow and evolve and have and and assuming the good the good governance uh at least a, a tolerable or decent governance structure yeah there are there are capacities one is uh speaking truth to power being able to say no to counsel being able to make uh tough calls being not being afraid to be the pointy end of the spear when it when it comes time um people who who uh respect politics is a big thing um you respect politics and then and therefore politicians and and honor the work that they they do honor like see the the nobility in in being elected and rep representing and people who i think focus on the concept of trustee or stewardship uh as a council member right so sometimes you make decisions you, you need to encourage council to make decisions that may not be good for their politics uh you can acknowledge that and you can help them communicate get better so maybe make it better politics make good good public policy good politics but, but you can acknowledge and recognize that and you're sort of attuned to that they have a, there's a, a political acuity that uh, um, or acumen that is required of, of the role i think people who are really good at finance or really good at uh, land use planning or really good at a thing um, that relates to municipal government um, but but don't have that broader perspective uh are not you know just because you've you've served for 20 years uh, uh in a role and then you, you're getting promoted because you're interested in the the job I, I think that that's that that's a recipe for for challenge what should then, council look for in a cao sorry to interrupt but oh yeah, no, no. because 
because uh, they, there's there's times when there there's CEOs there's councils who look for an engineer. There's a lot of infrastructure projects going on in our community right now, so we need a CAO that is an engineer by trade because they'll know the details a little bit better. Or we we have a lot of economic development going on in our community, so we need a good economic development person in uh, this role of CEO. In your in your opinion, and the opinion potentially of the uh, MMA. What should councillors and council and mayors be looking for in their CAOs if to fill those 30 vacancies that you talked about? Yeah, I, there's a lot of folks, uh, a lot of people that will will um, they do exactly that. You know, we've got some big infrastructure projects. We need an engineer uh, or we need to attract more industry. So we have to we have to hire, uh, you know, a CAO that's got economic development um, and they do that under the belief that that person can both be CAO and they can be the uh, city engineer or the public you know, works director, or they can be CAO and the economic de- uh, development director. So they're trying to get a twofer uh, in those cases. And that's wrong in, because if you need that focus, hire the skill set. They're not the same skill set. A, a CAO needs to be good at organizational behavior and understand how you create uh, behaviors and cultures that, that promote good governance, and and make good long term decisions, and that's a different skill set than being a good engineer or or a good economic. Not to say that those people can't be good CAOs; they absolutely could be, but they can't be both at the same time. Yeah. And and, and when you try to do that, I think you're going to fail at both. You're not going to you're or at least you're not going to be as successful as you could be. Invest in if your economic development is your thing, that's what you need to focus on. Hire a really good CAO that can uh, uh, develop an organization that supports the economic development department, but leave the economic development activities to the economic development director that you're going to hire in addition to the CAO. And, you know, you, you, you can't get around investing in people that just people are what make the organization work and you need to invest those dollars there. And sometimes you have to tax more to do that thing. So okay. I'm going to ask the I'm going to jump into our last segment here and it's about the future. Because I always like talking about the future to end these shows. And I want to know first off in your as president of MMA, what does the future hold for the the organization first? What does the future hold for MMA as an organization? That is a great question. I love it and I'm happy to say that uh you know uh we had some serious shakeup uh, in the organization and we changed our, our exec or there was a change in our executive director. The last one retired and, and uh, our new executive director has stepped in. So Adrian Bestland, uh, who, who sees the opportunity before her. Um, I am very different in my perspective on things uh, as maybe it comes across in this interview. Um, so we've, we've implemented a, a new strate- a written documented strategic plan uh, for the association, we're uh, taking some of the, the tactical worksheets and 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 the stuff that we've developed in Selkirk and implementing it here in at the association. So we we actually have some momentum and we have uh, we have a focus to the work that we're doing. We are fundamentally changing the training and development program um, with the MMA. Um, we are way more vocal than we ever have been in terms of advocacy for administration uh, to the point of being you know, maybe forceful at times to, to advocate for the needs of administrators and call things, you know, call issues what they are. And that means sometimes I have to say things that the deputy minister didn't expect me to say or or AMM expects me to say. But, um, and then the other thing is 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 uh, building the capacity of the people behind. So I have, you know, Nicole Chakota, who is going to even be better at this role when she, you know, hopefully she gets elected to be president. Um, she's extremely strong and, and we're thinking about that long term. How do we build a, a successful organization? We've been uh, underfunded uh, as it, one, because most of our revenue comes from training and development dollars. And when you have council members who are unwilling to even pay for the membership for their senior administrators to be part of our association, uh, you know, we have we're not we we always have to like uh, make sure that the prices are affordable for for communities we need to get more sponsorship and we've been working on that as well because the more resources we get the more training development and work that we can do we're just professionalizing um the work that we that we do as an association right so a professional association for professional administrators we've established uh we've changed our bylaws this last election unanimously put in a, a new code of conduct for administrators 
Um, if if we want to be seen as professionals, we have to hold ourselves accountable and treat ourselves as professionals. And so we've put that in place and we're building mechanisms to be able to hold individual members accountable. We've asked to talk to the province about changing our act. The MMA is established through act, an act of the provincial government. We've asked for changes to the the uh, uh, what we call our CMMA. That's the Certified Manitoba, Manitoba Municipal Administrators. Uh, it's the the certificate program that we have. We want to we want to change that. We want to make that a rather than an educational designation. We want to make that a professional designation so that that could be removed. So those are market indicators to to employers to councils to say this person is maintaining the you know they have a professional uh, they have a requirement for professional development. They're being held accountable to a code of conduct for administrators. So we, we want to professionalize the uh, association like other provinces have. We, you know, in Western Canada, we were the only ones that didn't have a clearly documented code of conduct or code of ethics. That's 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 table stakes. Shocking. Shocking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's just my own personal opinion there. Um, what about the role as the as the administrator? What does the future hold for that? Because you and I, we've talked a lot over the last uh, hour about this the the role, and I'm getting the sense that there's a lot of big challenges that the the role of the administrator faces over the next five, ten, fifteen years. Give me some hope, though. Because while municipalities are being asked to do more with less, the administrator knows that that means that their job is going to get a lot harder because they have to find the right person. They have to find the right staff. They have to find the right direction to move the, the municipality forward. And that's a daunting task for anyone. But it seems like you, and I'm only talking to you here, are up to the challenge. But are other municipal administrators up for that challenge? I would say, yeah. I, again, I, um, there's a, a wide variety of skill set in, in in administrators, just like there is in counselors, and just like there is in every, any other position. Um, I think there are little hints of of uh, reasons to be excited about or reasons to be hopeful around municipal administration. Um, and this podcast is one of those things. So, so Chris, uh, two or three years, three years ago, I'd say I looked for, I was looking for, well, maybe for looking for municipal uh, uh, administration, municipal government podcast, something that was meaningful. And there was nothing in Canada and there was very little in the States. There was a municipal equation out of South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, Carolina, somewhere. Uh, you know, there was very little. And and now we see some podcasts. We have people talking about municipal administration, right? Actually exchanging, uh, or municipal government even, exchanging ideas. Uh, you know, I, I think that there, um, there's more acknowledgement of the role and the work and the challenge. At, you know, the MMA, uh, you know, we, we were the MMAA. You know, we've changed, we've rebranded. We, we, we've got this new code of conduct. There are people who are, uh, on board about it. And I think the more we can show successful communities and the role that administration played in, in that success, right? Having strong administration allows you, allows communities to, to be thriving. Um, I think that there's going to be more investment and more realization that we have to go in this direction. The, the world is becoming more chaotic. Uh, um, no, don't say that. Yeah, Dwayne. Yeah. That's not true. But, but, but it, it, it's, it's, and at at, the, at this level of government, we have the most opportunity to be nimble and responsive and to, and to deliver things. And there's one of the things I love about municipal government is that everyone does it differently. And from that diversity, uh, new policy ideas come forward and we can adopt those and we can. So the more we talk about it, the more we exchange and, and, and learn from each other, the more we can have a kind of a hive mind and, and share these learnings and 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 fail quickly and and adapt to those things, the, the stronger uh, our communities are going to be. So the more communication, the more sharing, we're looking at trying to bring the associations across Western Canada to, to, together and and share training opportunities and and develop some some of those things. So aligning a little bit so that we can we can exchange across the borders, uh, cross borders, uh, you know, exchange ideas and learning and and just develop. So I, th I think I think there's reason to be positive about it, um, if only because we recognize the problem. You can't solve a problem unless you recognize it. I think the more we share, the more we talk about it, the the, the more um, uh, we we develop practices, the the more we can sort of tackle some of these things. So I think there's lots of reason to be positive about uh, municipal government and about municipal administration. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to say this on the record for you to hear and for those who are listening at MMA, but the next time MMA has an uh, conference, uh, an AGM, please let me know because I want to come and I want to sit down with some of the CEOs, do 15 minute interviews with some of the CEOs in the province of Manitoba. I'm going to be doing that with Saskatchewan, Alberta here as well, and BC, because I think there's an equation that I wrote for myself when coming up with the cross border interviews and moving to the municipal realm that municipal politics and governance is only the people at the council table. It's not. It's also the people behind the council table who actually make the city run or the town or village or the rural municipality run. So next time you do hold a conference, let me know because I will bring my equipment there and I will sit down and let's tell these stories because I think it's an important story that we need to start telling. Uh, thanks, Chris. I'm going to tell you right now, you're invited and we will make that happen. Awesome. Um, Dwayne, uh, I, 45 minutes turned into an hour and a half. That's the great thing about this. But thank you so much for doing this. Well, thanks again for the opportunity and for, for uh, uh, looking at Manitoba and, and asking us what's going on here. Thank you so much, Dwayne, for joining us for another special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. To our viewers, to you, thank you so much for tuning in and for being part of this conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please hit the subscribe button below so that way you can stay up to date on our latest interviews, special episodes, and so much more. We have some great conversations coming out and we can't wait to tell our stories and we can't wait for you to hear them. And if you're able to, and this is a big ask, and I know I always do it, but I'm going to ask again, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce high quality content like you saw today. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support municipalities matter and we want to try and make sure that they have a voice on the national stage a link to our support page on the cross-border interviews website is in the show notes and finally as much as we love our phones and technology let's remember to put them down and have real life in-person conversations even if it's just for five minutes thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of the cross-border interviews we'll be back again until then just remember just Keep talking.